don't want it, you'll be okay. Your mum is here to support you. Not everyone is aware that caring for a child with a disability can be not only stressful, but also isolating and can affect the carer's mental and physical health. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Here is Sharon's story. I think we knew quite early on that Sam was different and that he wasn't developing in the same way that Megan, my daughter, had. And it was very difficult for anybody outside the family to see. And Sam went to our works nursery and I think the first time anybody really outside the family noticed that things were tough was the nursery staff. And I, I'd let them know that he was going to be a handful and they, they welcomed that, you know, they said, fine, you know, it sounds like he's a proper little boy, you know, wonderful, bring him. And, you know, true to the word, they never ever said, he's too difficult for us, we can't manage. Um, and I'd go in and say, okay, what's he broke today? And they'd laugh or whatever, or, you know, it was really that kind of relationship with them. And then the one day they asked me to go in and sit down and I thought, oh, you know, what's he done, what's he done? And they said that he'd been, they'd been doing some art activities and he'd put some glue on a paintbrush but instead of putting it on the paper, he'd suck the glue off. And then while they were frantically trying to get him to spit it out, which, you know, again, I realise now Sam couldn't do that at that age. He'd grab some sand and ate that. And, you know, they were looking at me and they were, they were worried that this was really going to upset me. And I just laughed. And, you know, the looks on the faces were priceless. And they said to me, you yeah, know, why are you laughing? And my answer was because it's not just me and that was the first time that, I, that I'd really had someone else who'd had the sorts of difficulties that I'd had and so that was quite a powerful moment and I realised I could start letting go of some of that guilt that I'd got about it's the way I'm doing things I'm you know I shouldn't have had him, I was too old. All those things that had been running my head about it being my fault, I could start to let go of. And then I think things just took the toll really of trying to get the kids to nursery and to school and then go to work and do it all in reverse. And I just felt like I was on a, a treadmill and, and Sam's behaviour was deteriorating. They, was, they were saying they thought that Sam could go to a mainstream school, but I, I really didn't think that he could. But, it, you know, the educational psychiatrists who really are the gatekeepers for that were saying, no, no, he'll be fine in a mainstream school. And I just got more and more anxious and worried that they weren't going to manage him. And I just felt like I was running a race every day or, you know, get up early after a sleepless night and then get everyone where they've got to be, work, do it all, come back. And I felt like I was juggling, but managing somehow to keep all the balls in the air. And then the one day Megan said to me, quite out of the blue, Mum, you don't love me as much as you love my brother. And that, that was really a wake up call. And I, I realised then that I wasn't managing to successfully juggle everything and I really felt like I was letting her down badly and that summer holiday was really really difficult it felt like we were waiting for Sam to start, start school before anyone was going to get involved um, in the meantime they realised Sam couldn't go to a mainstream school and he went to a, a special school, which was really difficult at the time. Um, and realising that he was going to, you know, our worst fears had come true. 
we thought at the time that he'd got to go to a special school. And then the one day he came home with a leaflet in, in his bag and it was about play sessions up at the Sycamore Centre for during the holidays. And I remember thinking, this is fantastic. You know, it sounds like a great place and it sounds like, you know, he'll be safe there. And so I had a look further at the leaflet and it was from, it was from Scope's face-to-face -face service. Um, and at the time, I didn't even think about befriending. I just thought about the play sessions. And it wasn't until really we got to those that I started to feel like there were a lot of other people who were in the same boat that we were. And we started talking to other parents, um, found that our kids had got a lot in common, even if their diagnoses were different, and that, you know, the kids could go off and play. We could relax and have a cup of tea because we weren't worried that he was going to get out, that no one was going to look at us about why our child was behaving in such a strange way. Um, and I met the two coordinators and found out that they'd also got kids who'd got health problems and con so as a consequence just felt right at ease with them and it was it was like well they might be professionals but they're professionals who are also parents who've had to go through hard times with their kids as well. The other thing that we found with face to face was that we could go to coffee mornings and that became a real backbone of our support before and after the befriending training and I really look forward to them every month and then John my husband um, decided to go to the dad's group and it took some persuading to get him to go but he only went once and then realised how fantastic it was and now he'll go around and you know advocate for how brilliant it is and how supportive it is and so what I've discovered really is that through face to face all of us in the family has got something out of it and that's been you know fantastic.